Imagine doing business at the highest level of consciousness, being a conscious entrepreneur. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Be Your Own Boss. Our guest this week is a conscious business strategist. Her name is Shelley Bowman. Shelley is an American living in Hong Kong, and she has had a wonderful journey from having started a web design company way back in the 90s when internet was just getting started to having taught scuba diving professionally to helping coaches create content, create courses. Shelly has had an amazing journey and let's hear from Shelly about this journey, about her life. Shelly. Thank you so much for taking our time and uh, joining us here on the Be Your Own Boss podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. So as we do normally on the Be Your Own Boss podcast, let's start with your own story, your journey from the beginning. So tell, tell us about your, your parents, your siblings, and where were you born? I was born in Northern California. And... Um, I have one sister who's no longer with us, but she was 14 months younger than me. But she was, um, we were we were quite close until we got to be teenagers and then we just fought. But um, it's funny because we were totally opposite, you know, like I was very much, you know, into punk and classical music and she was in country western and she's she was a big blonde girl and I was like this skinny little brown haired girl and we were just like totally opposite. But um, yeah, and then when we grew up, she was super right wing and I was super left wing. So we were just always opposite. But um, yeah, so we grew up in this beautiful place called the Napa Valley. My dad passed when I was quite young. He was he was in a plane crash and that kind of affected, not like drastically, but there were certain things that were quite changed by that because my parents had already been separated. But um, yeah, so he was flying a, a small plane and he crashed, but um, he was already being married. But I was supposed to be with him. And then my mother had an intuition. And that one weekend is the only weekend she didn't let me go with him. So that was quite interesting. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was, she did what she could because she knew that like, she's the only parent. I had a stepfather by then. But um, she, she really tried to compensate for that. And we had a really nice childhood. It was mostly a lot of outdoors, a lot of camping, a lot of playing, um, you know, people talk about Gen X and how we drank from hoses, and it's true. <laughs> then, it, you know, the, the running around, like, you know, go, just get out of the house and run around and, like, break things and bones and whatever else. It was just, like, run around. And I got my first motorcycle when I was 10. And, um, and you know, we'd just come home from school and just, like, bye-bye and just be, like, because it, it was we lived in quite a rural area. So a lot of the kids would have motorcycles and we'd all just meet and go off jumps and everything. And, you know, every now and then you'd have a really bad fall and come home. But it was a lot of just being in nature. And, and uh, with that kind of an environment at, uh, at home, did you have aspirations back then that, uh, you know, growing up, I mean, like, did you have aspirations to become an entrepreneur or even coach uh, or anything like that that you've become today? Um, there was a few things that changed, like, that really pivoted for me. There was, and I didn't know this, obviously, at the time, but when I was six years old, I got busted. So I was, I was reading, um, I couldn't read. So I was in first grade in the States at six years old. It's first grade. I couldn't read. So during reading times, I would sneak in math books because I could do math. So I would feel secure with a math book. So I was, I was sitting there with a third grade math book because I'd taken myself through all the math books and um, in the classroom. And the teacher came and she found that I was actually had a math book inside my reading book when I was sitting there. And so they, they took me and got me tested and I was dyslexic. And so we actually moved to a place with a root, a reading clinic, not too far away, like um, maybe half an hour from, um, but we moved to St. Helena in the Napa Valley in Northern California, which is the wine area, it's beautiful, but they had a reading clinic. And so this one woman, Mrs. Calkins, um, 
she came every single day and did a reading clinic with me. And they had these old fashioned weird slide things and they would go through the letters. And by the end of that year, I could read. And so, um, and then later on, because I always wanted to be a fine artist. It was always my thing. I'm going to be a fine artist. I could draw really well because the dyslexia makes like, makes for very creative people. So, and it didn't really matter if you could read or not, if you were drawing. So I was always into drawing and, you know, making sculptures and things. So I wanted to be a fine artist. At some point, I think it was around 12, my dad said, okay, he, he managed a printing plant. So I knew how to run all the equipment in the printing plant. And um, he was like, this design studio in town um, has a new machine, a photo stamp machine. And you know how to run it, just go in, just so that you don't, you know, he was worried I'd be a starving artist. And so um, I went in and he said, just offer to work for free so you can learn like what they do in a design studio. And so I did, and they started paying me and I started doing designs and they started getting accepted by clients as like a 12, 13 year old. And this is exciting, but these people mentored me. And so, and I ended up going to the college in LA that they had all gone to called Art Center. And so those two instances of being mentored changed my life. You know, I went from being a kid who was going to be, you know, a, a fine artist who couldn't read to being, you know, someone who had a pretty good career potential. And I've had a pretty good career as a creative director um, because of those, you know, the, there was about maybe six or seven people in the design studio and they all just like took me under the belt and showed me things and showed me how to do things or just let me to my own devices and let me create designs and then would present it to the clients which is an honor as like a 12 or 13 year old kid and um and so yeah the trajectory of my life just because of those two, you know the group of mentors there and there um and so when i started working in tokyo which is my first job after college um, I just naturally started mentoring people because it's like, that's what you do. You know, if you can help people, you help them because I had people help me to such an immense degree when I was young. There's been so many people, I'm just mentioning two, but it seemed like there was so many people along the way that just like, you know, propped me up that like, why not? It's, it's called paying it forward now, but there was no such term. It was just like, you know, people, are, you've had the same, like you had people be really good to you. And so you wanted to feed people so they weren't hungry like you. It's just a natural thing that when you've been helped, you want to help people in a similar way. Absolutely. After you finished your, uh, you know, your, your school and your education, you, you went to Tokyo for, for a job. Talk us through that. Like, how did you decide that Tokyo of all the places? Um. Again, I was mentored by someone amazing at my, you know, at the college, it's, it's called Art Center. And there was this one teacher, it's like, you know, the, the one teacher that's super hard that no one wants to get. It's like, if I didn't get her, I would run and like change into her class. And her name was Sharon Aki and she was Japanese. And, and I also had a Japanese boyfriend when I was in college and they exposed me to like, because I'd gone to Europe, I traveled around Europe in between high school and college. So I, I went, my, traveling's always been in my blood, like I've always loved traveling. Um, but I'd gone throughout Europe, just hitting every museum I could. Like I was just this like sponge for anything art related. So by the time I got to college, I, I had a pretty good understanding of the concepts behind Western, um, art, Western design, Western ideology, but the Japanese, the stuff that was coming out of Japan right at that time was just crazy. There was Kurosawa, there was um, Iko Tanaka was a designer and they, these people were just doing amazing things. Um, and so I was exposed to that through these two people and her, her work ethic, like she would drive people, people would be crying and getting under tables because she was just so hard. And I was just like, this is, this is great. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I applied to a bunch of alumni from that school that were in Tokyo. So I went to Tokyo and at the time they can't really say no, because I'm not sending them digital files. I'm sending them slides, which were expensive. So I'm sending them a portfolio of slides. So they kind of have to see me. <laughs> And so 
I went and I met with some people and I got hired by someone. So that's how I ended up going there. And uh, it was funny because my first job was with a company that did interior design, but then they had a side thing that did graphics and their interior design was mostly for big hotels. So we were, they were um, helping design like the Hilton. They just finished the Hilton in Kyoto when I got there and they were, they'd started building the Hil Tokyo Bay Hilton which is near Tokyo Disneyland. And um, so I was, I did all the the logos for all the food and beverage outlets. I was going out there and I was art directing all the, the food styling and everything for all the, all the menus. I designed all the menus. It was like a pretty cool job as your first one out of out of school. Mm -hmm. to, and, you know, I'm, I'm meeting the head of, you know, Hilton International as this like, you know, little 20 year old kid. And it was, a, it was a pretty, uh, great responsibility and again I had two staff that hmm. were working with me and so I had to learn Japanese so that I could mentor them and I, it was funny because all the things that I wanted to um, do and be and see in, in Japan like all these crazy concepts it was like the top 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 percent so like if you worked for Eko Tanaka or, or Kurosawa you would essentially be making rice for the first 10 years before you get to catch the sushi kind of thing. You know, you you don't get near the master for until you've done the grunt work for ages. And so I ended up working in a normal studio and there, um, there was much more of a copy ethic. And so naze is, is why in Japanese. And so I would see someone and they would be doing like the top of the world restaurant and they'd have like this racing this has literally happened. This guy was looking at a rake scene magazine and copying the design for a, a menu for the top of the world, which is like a really high class restaurant. And I was like, Naze, Naze. <laughs> and he's like, it looks cool, basically. In, in Japanese, he was saying, but it looks great. It's like, it looks great, but the context is wrong. And so I was trying to teach them about like, um, mm. you know, you can't just copy, you have to know the context and make the design fit the context. And so that was an interesting journey there. And then I traveled around Asia for a year plus, and then I lived in Stockholm, and then I moved back to Tokyo. And um, and that was interesting because by the time I'd moved back to Tokyo, it went from kind of a very innocent existence to an existence that had rave parties and techno. And it was just like, it had exploded like so, you mean the city had changed? Yeah, it's it where the scene that I was in was had changed. Yeah. So I, right. I, um, I was the art director for Japan Airlines Insight Mag in like In Flight magazine. I was art director for special magazines for Nikkei Weekly and about maybe eight magazines. I was art director for, so I was constantly busy. I was like super work hard, play hard. You know that I was in the clubs on the weekends, and it was really just like absolute chaos. It was an interesting time to be in Tokyo because there was a lot of freedom. And so people were really taking advantage of it. And there was a lot of money floating around and stuff. So it was a kind of wild time. When did you move to Hong Kong and what, what was that? Uh, what brought you to Hong Kong? Okay, well, um, I had, I, I just mentioned that I had traveled around Asia and in right. Europe some. And when I was in China, I met someone and then we kind of kept in touch. And then when I was like transitioning from Stockholm back to, to Tokyo, I stopped and I saw him. And so we kind of got together at some point. Um, and then I'm, when I left after Tokyo, I was briefly in Paris and then um, back to the States. And then I got in touch with him and he was in the States. And so we moved in together and he was British. We decided since we'd met in China, you know, we both loved Asia. Let's go back before the handover. And so he was British, so he could he could get a visa easily because it was still a British colony. And then I came a few months later. Uh, when you moved to Hong Kong, uh, did you take up a job or did you uh, start your own business? What was your uh, life like in Hong Kong? Um, yeah, so I moved here in the beginning of 96. And I, I remember like going down to the bank and actually making the transfer to set up our limited company. Um, and so that was called Pure Goodness Limited, and it was a web development company. And so we, um, my boyfriend was a programmer, and I'm a designer, 
you know, creative director. So it just seemed logical. Let, let's try this. So I had a job with Star TV and he was, I think he was actually programming nuclear power plants in the States, but he was, he was doing it remotely. And so, I mean, he was just, he was super geek. And so, um, uh, yeah, working we, remotely in 96, that was my thing. Yeah. It's funny because there's these fold up little rattan, um, um, beach mats. They're like this kind of thing that they fold out and they fold out into like a full towel size beach mat. And he used to call it his llama briefcase because he would sit on the beach, like sitting there coding on the beach. <laughs> yeah. An, an original digital nomad. <laughs> yeah. But, and so, um, yeah. So you, you started your company there, uh, Pure Goodness. Your yeah. And so Volkswagen was our first client. So, um, Basically, I think, because I, I started putting little tiny ads, like I got excited about like banner ads, like, ooh, this stuff is new, you know, let's let's try some banner ads. And I put out banner ads that we were creating um, websites. And so people started contacting us. And one of them was Volkswagen Asia Pacific. And they, um, they wanted their website done, their first website. And so, you know, it was it was funny because it was a time or it, I don't know if you know how to use Photoshop, but there's something called layers. So you put things into a layer and you can move them around and it doesn't affect the other layers. But then they didn't have layers. So you put something into Photoshop and it just stayed there. So if a client said, like, move, you know, the, the, the logo over, you had to start everything all over again. And then, you know, my boyfriend would have to cut up the image and program it all over again. So it was, it was an interesting process because it was very um, labor intensive and he couldn't do anything without me. So he'd have to wait for me to get home from work and then tell me what, you know, the changes I need to make. And then he'd start cutting it up. Like literally I'd have to make it into little pieces that could then move around. It was an interesting process at that time. Like nothing, nothing that needs to be done right now. And this is, this is 1996, right? This is way really earlier than, you know, the, all, all the, the digital innovation that we have today. But, uh, so back then, it was uh, must have been quite interesting to start a website company in 1996. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah it was. Um, it was interesting because I think just we were, a lot of people didn't know that they needed even email, let alone a website. And so it, it was more the, um, the early adopters that were coming out of the woodwork and going, oh, you can do a website. And then, but then they would come to him and they would be like, oh, I heard there's this JavaScript stuff. I, I need a JavaScript website. And he was like, well, why don't you tell me what you need the website to do? And then I'll tell you the language that you know, people were coming like with their own doctor's prescription and telling them what they needed as opposed to like, this is what I want it to do, make it happen. Yeah. So. And uh, when you were working, you know, you had a job, you had, uh, and your your boyfriend also had his own uh, job, right? And both of you were still, I mean, apart from your jobs, you, you all were, you started your company. Um, did, how did you manage the time? Because you, you have your like full-time job and also this, and uh, was that challenging back then? Um. It was kind of exhausting. I remember coming home at night and him saying, oh, I need you to do this. And then I'd just be like, I just want to relax because I live on an island, a small island. So the commute into town is a ferry ride and then another ferry to where I worked. So it was a good like over an hour commute, like maybe an hour and a half each way. So by the time I got home, I was really tired and to come home and then just, you know, Oh, I need like another two or three hours out of you. And <laughs> be like, okay. <laughs> but I don't know. We were young. It was possible. Why not? Just keep doing it. And, but at the same time, I also became a Reiki master. So on the weekends and when I, when I had free time, <laughs> I started doing all the, the levels of Reiki and uh, working with a Reiki master on this little island. And, um, and I think that helped a bit because I started doing my own energy work and stuff on myself. So. Yeah. And uh, so, so you're on a dual path now. So you have your, you know, you're working on your Reiki and you also have your, your company. 
the website does it. How did things transform from there after that? Um, well, there was the dot-com boom here. And so because I knew how to do websites, uh, at some point I left Star TV and started with a company that was doing intranets for iBanks. And so that used to be a thing. I, I don't know if it still is, but so we kind of had this monopoly. Like we got one or two iBanks and then the other iBanks were like, oh, you did this for Morgan Stanley. Can you do one for us? And so we, we started getting all these investment banks, which Hong Kong has a lot of, um, to come and ask us to do their intranets. And at the same time, I had started teaching diving. And so I was working for two companies. One was called Expert Web and was brand BC or something like that. Between the two, they didn't need a creative director full time. So I would work like two weeks. I would kind of switch my time between the two. And then um, if I would try to take like two weeks off, like one of them, um, I left that company and just was focusing on one so I could take two weeks off. And so I started teaching diving in the Philippines. So about two weeks in Hong Kong working, two weeks in the Philippines teaching tech diving. So diving is another passion of yours. That's like the, 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 you're teaching tech diving and you're, uh, you're working as a creative director for a couple of weeks here. And then so, and uh, what happened to the website company that you to go like sell it out or uh, you continue with that website company? And um, no, eventually what happened is we split up, and because it was a couple, you know, we just dissolved right. the company. It was also like as you mentioned, the time management. It was, it was getting to be a bit much having the, the full-time job and the, the evening job. So we did several. We did the first Star TV website. Um, I mean, I was working for Star TV, but like kind of working with him in the evenings to get that done. And so, um, yeah, it was an interesting time. I was certainly working a lot. <laughs> and then uh, how did you move into the, the coaching side that, you, uh, that you're doing now? Um, yeah, I think because of what I mentioned to you before about having mentored, you know, had mentors change my life, it's just at some point it just became like I heard about a life coaching certification course and I just went through it. In between that, like when the dot com crash came, I took a job in China. So I was working in China. Um, and that was interesting. It was quite an interesting experience. But I, I would come home for the weekends. So I would live up there. They got me an apartment. And that was very interesting. And then um, and then I was working as the regional brand manager for a, an Australian multinational. Um, and so they were a project development company. So they were building up Dubai. They were doing a lot of infrastructure, tunnels, highways, freeways. So I, I was flying around. And that's when I... I don't know if it was when I first went to India, but yeah, I had to do a lot of like corporate identity training, branding training at our offices in the major cities in India, going around throughout Asia, but India, Dubai as well, Qatar. And, um, and then when the financial crisis hit, then I, um, I was made redundant along with most of the, a lot of the expats. And so that's when I did my MBA. And that's when I started my own company, Brand Catalyst Limited. That kind of segued into having a digital marketing company. Um, and, and then, I, I, I want to touch upon the point that uh, we were discussing before we started the interview. We were discussing about like sometimes uh, being your own boss is not a choice. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it just happens, right? <laughs> In yeah. your case, you wanted to take up a job. Yeah, well, what happened was I um, I did the MBA, I was running my own company, and then when the economy started picking up after the financial crisis, I started looking for jobs, and um, they just said I was overqualified, <laughs> so I had to be my own boss. <laughs> yeah. It was, corporate was not so much an option anymore. <laughs> because it was a financial crisis, I thought, okay, while I'm doing my MBA, I'll have my own company. But then once I finished the MBA, I just kept having my own company because um, when I would go and interview at corporates, they were just like, um, you're overqualified for anything we have, or 
they would offer something that was so under what I'd been paid at the previous company that I would be like, no, it's, I'd rather do do this on my own, on my own terms. Um, But what kind of happened with a few companies was that they would want me as a consultant. And then it would be like, okay, come in for a few days a week or one or two days a week, and then a few days a week. And then it's like, can you come in every day? And then it's like, well, that's a job. I don't really want a job anymore. Because once you get used to being your own boss and like, okay, I, t- this morning I want to get up at seven and go for a hike. And then I want to, you know, go into the office at 10 o'clock. You know, when you have a corporate job, they, they kind of don't like that if you just show up whenever you want to show up. <laughs> Whereas with, as you're, if you've been used to being your own boss, it's kind of, you get used to that freedom of, I could be very disciplined and diligent in terms of time and just getting things done, but I don't necessarily want to be in an office when people tell me one when to be in an office and so that's just been my path and um, I'm grateful for it because like during COVID when there was a lot of people that were caught out I was fine working from home this is great I get to work from my I have a beautiful roof garden and a meditation center like area I'm just like I'm fine working from home this is great <laughs> and plus because I'm um, doing things um, on my own for, I've been using Zoom for for years before COVID hit. So people were coming to me and asking like, how do you use this Zoom thing? <laughs> you know, teachers, parents, whatever, um, yoga teachers, people that were trying to catch up. And so I was already online mostly. Yeah. And let's talk about the, the course creation that I mean, you, I you have coaches, right? So uh, this is what you do now as a conscious business strategist. Yes. So. Um, when I was running the digital marketing companies, at some point I decided that, you know, I have to try coaching because I'd become a certified life coach. And it, I think it, it all came to fruition around the same time I was initiated by Sadhguru in 2017. And at this time I decided that, you know, I really want to do something more in that space and that like helping people directly space. And so because I became a Reiki master, but over the years, I also started reading the Akashic records and doing other healing modalities. I wanted to bring that together, like the business strategy, you know, I had an MBA and all this, you know, I wanted to bring it together so I could help conscious entrepreneurs that were using their business to help people to really hone their strategy to who they are at soul level. And so that's how the the coaching came about as is marrying the, like the, the strategic and the, the more spiritual or more esoteric. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was just more aligned with who I become. And, you know, I, even before I was initiated by Sadhguru, I was doing about two hours of meditation and yoga practices every morning upstairs. And so, you know, it was just kind of flowed into what I do. Plus having had the background of really wanting to mentor and help people. And that had happened a lot when I was in China, I would, you know, I was teaching my staff to, to, to do design and teaching them like English and you know it, it, I've always been some form of coaching and helping people yeah. and when you get to a position where you're a leader and people trust you they come to you with like you know I'm having troubles with this or I've got this situation at home or whatever people come and they want to talk so it's like is it mentoring is it coaching is it life coaching you know it was just like you know I help people and so it wasn't a far stretch. It was just kind of a natural movement. And then, um, then the people that I was, I was coaching, I had a high ticket coaching program for conscious entrepreneurs and they were doing so well, like so amazingly well that they want to do what I was doing. And they all asked to, you know, they all wanted to start courses or start their own coaching program. And, um, you know, uh, like short of me setting up all of their marketing systems and writing all of their copy, you know, I, I was like, well, let's, you know, I can help you with the coaching, but I'm not going to set up all of your coaching programs. And so um, then I got kind of recruited or asked to be the CEO of a wellness web three company. So it took like some time off. Um, and, but then I started coaching my staff. I was like, I really miss coaching. So I started coaching my staff and um, using doing like inner critic and imposter syndrome and just helping them get out of the comfort zone and really just helping them. And I was like, I miss coaching. So I need to go back to that. So when the, 
the it was a web3 project so when the crypto crash happened i just like okay that's going to be put on the side i created like um eight 21 day healing quests which are in an app it's called zenful um and so that that's just is until the the markets go back up but um yeah so when i came back to coaching i was like the biggest way that I can make an impact and help people is with course creation because, you know, I'd, I'd started 25 years ago setting up diving courses, you know, creating diving courses, social media courses. I've, I've taught so many different kinds of courses. So it's, it's really easy. Plus I know all the tech behind it. I can build landing pages and funnels like, you know, it's super easy for me. So I'll do that. And I found some software that helps write all the copy. And now with AI, it's really helpful. So there's so many things that all came together. I was like, this is something where I can really help people, help coaches. Because as when I was creating my first coaching program, I was in a coaching program where I would see the other coaches, and they didn't know how to write copy. They didn't. They were really uncomfortable with tech. You know, they were coaches. They weren't marketers. And so I thought, okay, how could I take away that pain? If I could find a system that could write all the copy as you create your course all the like headlines, hooks, um, video sales letters, all of these things. And then I could guide people how to create funnels and, you know, nurture them through that part. That could be where I could have the most impact. And so that's what I do now. And it's really, I was telling you this before, it's so fulfilling. Like I've got course creators now that when they came, they were just like, you know, this is such a big idea. And now they're launching, they're beta launching. They're like, this is so amazing. Cause I kept saying, you know, you're closer than you think. You are so much closer than you think. And they're brainstorming and it's like, oh, this is never gonna happen. And and then now they're launching and it's just so rewarding seeing them. And it's they're, they're beaming when they talk about it. This was one woman, she just finished her first four day challenge. And she's just like, oh, this is amazing. And you know, all these people showed up and they showed up every one of the four days. and. Another one did her um, her first master class, and you know, is she's enrolling people, and you know, the people that I'm working with are just dreams. They're just crushing it, basically. So, it's it's like my next phase, and it's like this is so much fun. Yeah, and, and you're creating an impact, right? You're creating a huge impact in their lives by helping them create the content, create the the, the course, and and then they're. Uh, you know, they're crushing it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the course program is called Quantum Course Creation. And the, course. yeah. And so um, my previous coaching program had been like Quantum Shift because I was moving these entrepreneurs and, and they were having like quantum shifts because I was using the Akashic Records. So I just kept with that because I can get people to at a, at a relatively quick pace, like within three months, they can have a high ticket course. And um, one of these people I knew from a while ago, and she's she's quite young, like in her late twenties, and um, she's now at the point where she can have, you know, easy 10k months by, you know, selling a few courses. And this is a, you know, was unfathomable to her a few months. You know, she started in February, but um, and she's just like, you know, kind of in an I don't believe this is happening kind of phase. So Sherry, now looking at your. Uh, journey with the kind of experiences that you've had, kind of mentors that you you had in your life, and then you became a mentor for so many, and then you're coaching, you're making a difference now. With these these experiences and the you know, you, maybe there are some mistakes that you must have made. Um, what would be your advice to people who are just getting started now, the aspiring entrepreneurs who would like to become entrepreneurs? Uh, what's your advice for them? Um, if you're going to have a business partner, really get to know them well, because that person is going to be a big part of your life. And um, so that's that was a huge learning curve for me, because I had a few business partners that turned that seemed okay, but turned out not so not so um, uh, beneficial. And it would have been more beneficial to be on my own. And so that was one big lesson is to, if you, you know, you're going to have a very tight relationship with a business partner. So don't get, it's, I don't want to say get into bed with someone that you don't know, but it's like, literally you're going to have a connection with that person on a daily basis in the business. And it's not like a, an employee that you can get rid of. It's a business partner. So 
enter into a business partnership very carefully. But um, on the on the plus side, if you find someone like I'm one of my um, the the clients that I've worked with, she's in a very productive business partner with someone who really compliments her. So I'm not saying don't do it. It's just get really get to know and make sure that you compliment. Like I'm super creative and not necessarily business oriented. I would do best with like a business oriented, you know. So, so if you put me with someone who's super disorganized, it's not going to work. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there, there's that. And then also, uh, really, you need to as an entrepreneur, you need to have your own. Uh, you you can't give from an empty cup. Like daily meditation has, you know, has been so essential to me, and. Um, and I don't, I'm not preaching that everyone gets, you know, gets, a, gets, you know, devoted to a guru or, you know, gets religious or whatever. I'm just saying that some form of self, self in, like practice is really good. And, you know, meditation is an, an obvious one, but, you know, other people, it might be like, I go for a walk most evenings when it's not raining. I go for a long walk in nature. I start my mornings in meditation. I go for a long walk in nature those replenish me to a point where I can work pretty diligently. So some form of replenishing so that you can, you know, cause if you're just sitting down and like, I've got to do everything myself and I've got to work really hard, you're going to burn out. So it's like having that time to, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you can make your own schedule, build in to your schedule that I will have me time to like replenish that cup. So maintain that balance. Have have a me time to re rejuvenate yourself. Yeah, yeah and people, uh, people talk about the, the work life balance, and I don't think you should think of it as work and life balance. It's like when you love what you're doing, you're always working and you're never working. So it's more like just making sure that that it's it's a holistic package. That you know, I get a lot of my work ideas when I'm out on my walk or when I'm meditating. You know, so it's it's intertwined. It's not work-life balance. Yeah, yeah. You don't switch on, switch off um, into one mode to another. Right? It's, just, it's it's inter interconnected. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this, this is one of the things I wanted to ask, and I think you kind of touched upon that. So, when um, looking at the, the 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 way you've overcome challenges in your life, and the way you have, uh, you know, your life has turned out, right? What is that one quality uh, that you would like to attribute your success to? Is there something that's specific, um, one exercise or one uh, activity or one quality that uh, that kind of that's your strength? Um, have you heard of *Man's Search for Meaning* by Viktor Frankl? It's a book. And he was a Holocaust victim, and his whole thing was in that book. And you know, his philosophy was, the outside is happening, good or bad. It's your take on it, is the important thing. You know, he was a Holocaust victim, and he survived because he chose to think, okay, you know, that's happening outside. What can I do inside? So it's more that internal resilience of just, I can, I can handle what's on the outside as long as the inside is okay. Yes, so be more uh, rooted inside, and, and uh, your strength comes from the Yeah, and just like you know, it's a storm today. Does that mean me? You know, sad? <laughs> no, it's like it, it. It is as it is. And I read somewhere recently that if people can say, "It is as it is," and just deal with it, they're going to do much better because. It is. It literally is as it is. <laughs> you can't like, change yeah. as it is. So let's let's just go. Okay, it is as it is. What can we do with it? Well, yeah. And uh, if, if if there is a storm outside, uh, you can't change it, but you can get on the Be Your Own Boss podcast and uh, do an interview. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hopefully, the the lightning wasn't too disturbing. No, uh, that's fine. And uh, we, we get to get to experience the you know uh, Hong Kong weather from here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, 
I would like to also ask you about the, uh, you know, the, uh, about looking at your journey. Is there anyone that you would like to, any one person that you would like to give the credit to for your success? My mom, my grandma, the people that just said, like, I just want you to be happy. Just do what you want. They were, I was never told you must get married. You must, um, you must have kids. You must do this. You must do that. I'm, I'm married now, but, you know, I didn't want to most of my life. Like we've been together 16 years, but it wasn't like I was pressured at any point to get married, to have children, or it was just go do what you want. I was, by the time I was 24, I'd been in 24 countries. I've always just traveled and done what I wanted. My paternal father, he was very supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Even when I was, you know, a, a little kid, he didn't say, you're a girl, you're supposed to wear dresses. It was just like, do what you want, climb trees, go whatever. So having their support to just like do follow my own whatever and my husband's he will like i'll just say like okay like in a few weeks i'm going to fiji i'm like sweetie i'm going to fiji he's like okay have fun (laughs) it's like i i've had a lot of people that support like just me going to my parents like okay i'm moving to tokyo and they're like okay (laughs) you know do what you want (laughs) as long as um I think as long as you're following your heart and there's people that there support you in that direction, you, yeah. you know, it's nice. A lot of people don't have that support, and I didn't really know that until I got to college. And I, and because I was at a commercial arts school, and people told me, you know, their parents weren't supporting them; they didn't want them to do that. You know, in Asia, a lot of people want their kids to be doctors or lawyers, and they don't really support or engineers. Them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so um, or engineers, yeah, and so. Yeah it's like having that support maybe it's not your parents maybe it's your aunt or an uncle or something um but someone that's like your cheerleader is really important absolutely so shelly for um for the audience uh, the people who are watching this listening to this uh, those who would like to benefit from the services that you offer as as a coach as content creator as a as a course creator What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Shelly.com. That's my website. That's my website. Nice. Nice. Yeah, Yeah, I have a Facebook group. It's called High Ticket Mastery for Conscious Coaches. So they could join that, High Ticket Mastery for Conscious Coaches, or they could go to Shelly.com and reach out to me there. Right. And uh, it... you know, if I, if I understand right, your focus is on entrepreneurs, on on businesses that make uh, are making an impact in, in the world, right? In businesses, and you're helping yes. them with that impact. Yeah, so it's, it's more conscious coaches, conscious consultants, um, people that are more in the space of helping other people, light workers, healers, uh, wellness experts. Experts that essentially want to productize their, their wisdom and share that with people. And one thing that I mentioned before, I don't know if I did, but um, there's that that old idea of the wise elders that gathered around the fire and they shared their knowledge around the fire. That doesn't happen now because the people that are sharing their knowledge are like, you know, 20 something year old influencers. So I wanted to create a course creation process that could help someone like we have a friend called Bharat, you know, someone like that. That might not be tech savvy or marketing savvy but has an incredible depth of wisdom to share so it's like not only the the coaches but also the wise elders you know if if people have that knowledge but they don't have the tech skill and marketing i want to have a place for them to also offer their knowledge because we don't have campfires much anymore <laughs> where people can you know pass on their wisdom and the reach, right? The, the way you are helping um, people with wisdom and people who have something to share with the world, the way you are helping them create this content, create the, the, the courses, um, you're helping them reach a much wider audience, much larger uh, than they, they could ever do sitting around fire and talking about. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think we have, we've evolved uh, as as mankind. We've evolved a lot in storytelling, and uh, yeah, this is a form of storytelling as well. Like you know, on the Bureau of Boss podcast, like I said, you know, the, the, the format is 
through storytelling, you want to uh, you know share share uh, knowledge. So, how has your uh, how has your experience been uh, being on the show on this interview? Oh, this is fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't because I have my own podcast, uh, the Conscious Business Strategies. I usually on the other side where I get to listen to people. I don't usually talk about myself so much. So <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> yeah, and it was definitely fun. I, I loved it, and uh, it was a great conversation. And thanks for sharing all the nuggets of wisdom, and thanks for sharing your your journey and your story with us, Shelly. Thanks for being on the show. Yes, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that was Shelly Bowman, the conscious business strategist. And you've been watching and listening to Be Your Own Boss. Oh, oh, oh.